From Hollywood, the CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. The Silent Witness, produced and directed by William N. Robeson, starring Mr. Raymond Burr. This is a play for one person. His voice and his alone will you hear. You will meet other persons. Your imagination will endow them with being, clothe them with costume, justify their motives, and evaluate their ethics. But you will hear only one voice, the voice of Raymond Burr, interpreting the role of Henry Charrington, district attorney. Silent Witness, an experiment with your imagination. And so, at last, it came to trial. The state versus William Bart, the charged murder. A cheap, stupid murder. The murder of a small-time lawyer. The accused, an elevator boy. Boy, well, a man. The motive, fear. Fear of an accusation of theft. The theft of a gold watch. It was the sort of case that would be forgotten with tomorrow's newspapers excepting for one point of interest, a point avidly seized upon by the press. You see, the principal witness for the defense, Alice Gardner, as you know, was unable to talk. The shock of the murder had been too much for her. She had suffered a stroke. One side of her face and her vocal cords were completely paralyzed. She was able to write, of course, a haphazard scrawl, but legible enough. Alice Gardner was brought directly from the hospital to the courtroom. I opened my cross-examination with delicacy. You can't attack a sympathetic witness too soon. Now, as you know, Miss Gardner... The judge has allowed that you may nod your head for yes and shake your head for no. If the answers to my questions require more than these indications, you may continue to write them on the pad of paper by your side. Do you understand? Good. Now, you must understand that we here seek only justice. Not the primitive justice of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but the justice of man-made laws for the preservation of society. Now, if I attack your answers, it is not that I do not feel for you, that I have no grain of human sympathy within me. It is because I am a public servant whose duty it is to see that murderers do not go unpunished whatever sentimental bulwarks of protection may be placed before them by honest but wrong-thinking persons. Oh, I, I see you're writing already. May I? Thank you. You write that William couldn't kill anyone. I see then it is my duty now to convince the jury to the contrary. Miss Gardner, you are a um, friend of one William Bart, age 32, occupation, elevator attendant at Clifton Gardens, a block of service apartments? Yes? Hmm. Do you know of a person called Howard Lieberman, lawyer? You do? You uh, want to write? Please do. No, oh, don't hurry, don't hurry. We don't want to rush you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Miss Gardner has written, I was responsible for Mr. Lieberman's apartment. Now, Miss Gardner clearly means that she was the service maid for that particular apartment, Mr. Lieberman's. That is so, isn't it, Miss Gardner? Yes? Thank you. Now, uh, Miss Gardner... On the night of November 3rd, were you on duty? You were. And so too, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, was William Bart. 
And, Miss Gardner, did you hear a disturbance in Mr. Lieberman's apartment? You wish to write an answer? Very well. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a matter upon which I would like the jury to be absolutely clear. Ah, thank you, Miss Gardner. Miss Gardner writes, No disturbance called by bell in service room. I see. To be more explicit, you were called to Mr. Lieberman's apartment by a numbered bell which rang in your service room in the basement. Is that so? Good. And you went to the apartment and found Mr. Lieberman fighting with William Bart. No? I put it to you that Mr. Lieberman was trying to throw him out of his apartment. Yeah, let me see. Miss Gardner writes, no fight, struggle. Struggle? Huh. Well, Miss Gardner, the difference between a fight and a struggle is, in this instance, academic. You do know, of course, that Mr. Lieberman had accused Bart of stealing something. You know what it was? You point to my arm. A wristwatch? What Miss Gardner is trying to say, ladies and gentlemen, is that Lieberman had accused Bart of stealing a gold wristwatch from his apartment. Now, didn't Lieberman say that he intended to have Bart fired? He did? Yes, please do. <coughs> Thank you. Miss Gardner writes... He had no proof. No proof, Miss Gardner. No proof? William Bart, you will remember, and yourself are the only persons accepting the manager who had pass keys. I suggest to you that Lieberman called William Bart to his flat, accused him of the theft, and Bart confessed. And now I will tell the court the motive for this robbery. The motive, ladies and gentlemen, was the age-old one of necessity, the need for money. Because, because, Miss Gardner, William Bart was obliged to support a divorced wife. This obligation and the one he felt he owed you were more than he could fulfill. Now, I'm sorry, Miss Gardner, deeply sorry. If only there could have been some other way. But the medical evidence, as a result of your illness, the child you lost, oh, so often in this court we have seen something that could have been a thing of joy turn into a sordid parody. And thank you. Miss Gardner writes, William did not steal the watch. I did. Then, Miss Gardner, how do you account for the fact that Bart admitted stealing the watch to the police last night, told them of its hiding place, from which it has been retrieved and is now lying, Exhibit 17, upon that table there? Miss Gardner, you feel you have recovered enough to continue this cross-examination? Good. I am sorry it was necessary to shock you as I did. You now know that William Bart is a self-confessed thief and that you have perjured yourself for a dream. You know also the consequences of perjury. Lies are futile, Miss Gardner. One is always caught. Now, with the permission of the court, I am going to put to you my reconstruction of the crime. I would like you to bear with me until I'm finished. Now, Miss Gardner, after the struggle, the struggle in Lieberman's apartment you returned to your service room, correct? 
But what about Bart? He goes to the basement, makes up the furnace, another of his duties, goes to his room. He smokes a cigarette. Gradually, he realizes the enormity of his offense. Ridden with guilt and fear, he decides to plead with Lieberman, offer to return the stolen watch. He takes the elevator back to the third floor, realizing that if he rings the doorbell, he will get no further than a foot in the door. He enters quietly with his passkey. Lieberman is startled by Bart's unexpected entrance. He orders Bart out. Bart pleads with him. Lieberman is adamant. Bart's attitude changes. He lunges for Lieberman, who strikes back. They struggle into the center of the room, knocking over a small table on which is a steel paper knife. Bart grabs it and plunges it into Lieberman's throat. He stands there for a few throbbing seconds, forcing his numb brain to think. That's it, a burglary. He must make it look like a burglary. He tears the books from their shelves, completely disarranges the room. In the midst of his evil work, he catches sight of the blood on his clothing. It frightens him. He must get away. He dashes to the elevator, making for the basement to cleanse away those stains of guilt. The elevator begins its descent. But for William Bart, it is a descent to hell. For here points the finger of irony towards him. The elevator jams between floors. And there he is, trapped like an animal in its cage, the mark of Cain upon him. One can well imagine the horror that overcomes him as he stands there between those walls, staring stupidly at the sign in the elevator which reads, In case of danger, ring emergency bell. The bell that will ring in his room in the basement. Yes, he is in danger, but he cannot ring for himself. Some minutes pass, and a certain Mr. Vince from an apartment above calls to borrow a book. He discovers the body, phones the police. They arrive only to find their murderer already trapped and waiting for them in his cell of guilt. The jammed elevator. Fate can sometimes be both judge and jury. That, ladies and gentlemen, is my reconstruction of the crime, one made possible by my one and only visit to Lieberman's apartment some days after the murder. I see you've been writing, Miss Gardner. Thank you. Miss Gardner wishes me to tell her how I knew about the notice in the elevator, the notice saying, in the case of danger, ring emergency bell, when the notice was taken down two days before the murder and one with different words put up. Well, I I suppose I must have seen a similar notice in some other elevator. Oh, uh... All this is beside the point. It is not evidence, has no bearing. Huh? Thank you. Now, Miss Gardner writes, the elevator had been jammed by someone on the third floor. Oh, my. This absurd theory has been put forward already by the learned counsel for the defense, who has tried to show that many people have been trapped in similar old-style elevators as a result of mechanical failure. But even so, if some person, I say if some person, let us say a Mr. X, did jam the elevator, the problem is then, where was he when William Bart was in the apartment? The defense has put forward the remarkable theory that this mysterious Mr. X was in the apartment himself, that having killed Mr. Lieberman, he is searching the apartment for valuables. Suddenly, he hears the elevator coming up, panics, dashes to the bedroom to find the fire escape. There is none. He hides in the bedroom. William Bart enters the room, 
sees Lieberman's body, runs for the elevator. Mr. X realizes that if Bart gets downstairs before he does, all is lost. He follows him, swiftly jams the elevator, runs down the stairs and out of the building. And now we come to the defense's preposition and question of Mr. X's motive. We have it on evidence that nothing of importance seems to be missing from Mr. Lieberman's apartment except the gold watch which William Bart has admitted stealing. And now why? Why should anyone wish to put William Bart on the spot? Lieberman led an ordinary everyday life we have no evidence of emotional upsets, financial difficulties, or anything else to suggest some other assailant. What then could be the motive? Save the theft of the gold watch. You wish to write, Miss Gardner? Very well. Oh, dear. Pencil broken? Never mind. Take my pen. I hope you don't mind the green ink. Now, Miss Gardner. Miss Gardner... Quick, someone. Quick, she's fainting. Well, Miss Gardner, I trust you are feeling better now. Good. I see you have already written something for me, written during the recess, I presume. I, I shall read it to the court. Thank you. Miss Gardner writes... Two days before Mr. Lieberman's death, I was clearing out his rooms. As I was taking away his waste paper basket by his desk, I noticed on the floor a sheet of paper completely covered with writing in green ink. Green ink. <laughs> I thought it must be rubbish, and I took it away with the other stuff. Sometime later, Mr. Lieberman rang and asked if I had seen this piece of paper as it was important. When I said that I had taken it away, he was very angry. Miss Gardner, what did you do with that paper? What did you do? Thank you. I burnt it. You. You burnt it? <laughs> well, then, it appears that the coincidence between that letter and my using green ink is not going to advance us further in our search of an alibi for Bart, is it? Uh, thank you, Miss Gardner. Miss Gardner writes... Mr. Lieberman then said it did not matter as he had six micro photographs taken of it. Mr. Lieberman said he was sending them to some people who would be interested. Did he, Miss Gardner? Then we can only presume that they have been sent to the persons for whom they were intended. I wonder why they haven't mentioned them in the light of present events. Huh? Oh, thank you. Perhaps they were not important. Of course they... Of course they could not have been. Now, Miss Gardner, when did you first become aware that a crime had been committed? Oh, you're out of paper? I'll get you some. You... Oh, you have some in your purse? Good. Good. Oh, bags of envelopes. Yes, I suppose they're all right. But those are unmailed. No, they can't be. I... Uh, Miss Gardner, I have one final question. Do you know who the mysterious Mr. X is? You do? Would you care to write the name on your envelope and, and give it to me? No? Well, you must. And give it to me. If the, if the answer is the, is the right one, it may be of profit for all of us to know. 
any name, even if it is not the one we expect, could raise an element of doubt and perhaps save William Bart. Oh, write, uh, write the name and... and... Give me that envelope and don't point at me like that! Give it to me! Yes, Padre. I murdered Lieberman. Some time ago, I misappropriated the funds of a client of mine. They... They'd been left in my trust. I wrote a complete confession to him, as it happened in green ink. He decided not to prosecute, since I promised to, and in due course did repay him. But he kept my letter. When he died, Lieberman, who was his lawyer, found the letter in his papers. That sanctimonious fool thought that a man like me had no right to try for the Senate. He thought he could stop me. Me. I would kill a thousand like him, Padre, with as little conscience as I'd kill a fly. He threatened to expose me if I ran for office. I went to reason with him. I argued with him, offered him money, anything. But he was mule-stubborn. You wouldn't be bought. He wouldn't be bought. So I killed him. The rest is as the defense put forward. How was I to know that Lieberman would give these letters to that stupid maid to mail when she came on duty? Or that she would keep them in her purse until after she left the building? And then the crime, the hospital for her, the letters with the micro photographs lying, waiting, waiting until... That, Padre, is the last confession of Henry C. Charrington. The truth. All truth. And these, I presume, are the gentlemen who are to escort me to the chair. I've sent quite a few people to you, haven't I, gentlemen? And now... It's my turn, hmm? <laughs> Ironic, isn't it? You have just heard the CBS Radio Workshop's Hollywood production of The Silent Witness, written by John Train. A one-man play. Raymond Burr was the man. Next week, the CBS Radio Workshop originates from New York. The play, a fantasy. The title, The Green Hills of Home.